Welcome back to yet another episode of Matrix Tech Talk. Today, we have a super exciting guest, James Wu from all the way across the Atlantic. James, welcome to Matrix Tech Talk. Thank you so much for having me. James has got a super impressive profile. He was a tech lead in Google, Apple, even Baidu, and now he's a startup founder and CEO. James, so why don't you tell our audience a little bit about you yourself your passion, your background. Before I started DeepMap, I was working for uh, many map companies. I actually worked for five different map companies before I started DeepMap. And uh, uh, this including uh, two startups and three big players, including Google and Apple. I think the core uh, fundamental issues. Um, I really like mapping. <laughs> and I got my PhD in computer science, focusing on computer graphics, computational geometry, and the geometry modeling. Well, after I got my PhD degree, there's this kind of revolution of online mapping and satellite imagery. Um, and uh, the evolution of Google Maps, mobile maps, Apple Maps. So I was very, very lucky getting involved in this revolution. Well, as I was thinking that I might be done with mapping after I launched Apple Maps, uh, help launch Apple Maps, I realized that actually there's new type of mapping problem for self-driving cars. And uh, it's HD map. HD map become uh, one of the road blockers to uh, the uh, uh, development or deployment of self-driving car technology. That's why I started DeepMap with my co-founder, Mark Wheeler, four years ago. There's a couple of challenges uh, in making HD map. One thing is uh, how to make a machine map, right? Before we were using a navigation map for humans. Now we're talking about a machine map that is super precise to centimeter level, right? And then at the same time, this map needs constantly update. So it's very difficult to make. For a navigational map, you can update it like once a year or twice a year or even in a couple of years, a few years, it probably will be fine. But for a machine map that's guiding a, a self-driving car, the map needs to be as fresh, as new as possible. So map update become a major problem. And map precision is critical, as I mentioned. Well, on, this, on the second part, the map has to be as cheap as possible. As otherwise, we can't, true, afford, yeah. we can't afford to use uh, one type of map uh, like that. And third one, is the map business model needs some change because the owner of the map, uh, of course, they, they, some of them are willing to share the data. Some of them may not willing to share the data. And even if they want to share the data, they want to have significant control or uh, a license agreement to be able to use the data for other purpose, including training the perception system, or do simulation and other R&D efforts for self-driving cars, using it in simulation, right? All those things. So that's also need a revolutionary change in the uh, business model. So that's why we start DeepMap, try to attack all these problems to help the self-driving car industry move faster. Amazing. So you mentioned several stimulating points. Um, HD maps for uh, humans and machines, two different, uh, two different categories. So could you elaborate that a, a little more? Like when we're talking about machine, you mentioned several points that it has to be updated and the precision is, requires to be much more, which I totally, totally agree. Now, what would be the advantage of such a map in an AV domain? Uh, we have now um, ADAS functionalities uh, and um, the problem that I see personally in, in our company that uh, GPS accuracy is not, you know, we don't, do not really have also high definition GPS, like, you know, the GPS accuracy. And same goes for map. 
Yeah, so these are the two problems. We're heavily depending on sensors, uh, radar, light, or camera. We definitely, definitely need a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth um, angle of positioning. And tell me a little bit about that. How is it gonna help your um, idea of high, def high definition maps in our industry? For HD map, uh, I think there's a couple of things. Number one, saying that it can be, it's necessary for self-driving car is because it's needed by the self-driving functionality. Because for HD map, you need to do a lot of route, uh, uh, lane level navigation and routing plan. Um, and this is necessary for control the vehicle, uh, can help localize the vehicle uh, precisely inside the map and the real world. So there's a few critical component that you need from the uh, HD map, including speed limit um, and, uh, and uh, the curvature and all this uh, uh, regulation. So two levels, right? One level is like the digital clone of the environment. You need that kind of uh, information to understand the geometry of the environment to control the car. The other level is like regulations, like speed limit, if you can make a left turn. So uh, these, these are necessary for the functionality of self-driving car, like localization and control. The other thing is um, it's a very critical safety uh, related redundancy system. There's a lot of uh, interesting feature about HD map. First, you know, if you look at any sensors, there has kind of a range, LIDAR, camera, uh, radar, but for map, you don't really have a range limit for if you treat it as a, like a sensor. And you don't have a lot of the physical obstacles. So if you have a truck blocking your eyesight, you probably won't be able to see the traffic light or even the lane lines in front of you. But for, if you have a HD map, you know where the lane lies. You know where the traffic light is, uh, with, with or without obstacle. Uh, so it's kind of a have no range and no obstacle in terms of uh, sensing. So if you treat us like an extra sense, a sensor. The other thing is it's a redundancy for the perception system. So you don't have, we don't have a 100% accurate perception system. Right, um, when you, your perception system has issues and make errors, the uh, mapping system can be a redundancy check for the perception. If your perception detects there's a lane line, however, you know the map says there's no lane line, there's no stop line. Which one are you going to trust? Maybe you, maybe the map is outdated. Maybe the perception has failed. So whatever the case it is you have a lower credibility of the output of the perception system. You need to double check because either the environment changes or the uh, perception has errors. This will impact the safety of the self-driving car system. Um, and this, is, uh, this is can also be critical to identify some issues like if your sensors are still working properly. Right? So if you don't have a very good HD map or a prior knowledge of the environment, it, it can be difficult to even calibrate your sensors properly because you don't really know if the sensors has errors or not. Fascinating. Yeah, so in general, HD map is critical for the safety of self-driving car technology. Mm -hmm. and, and then the major problem of people not, uh, actually it's not like the L2 plus players, the OEMs are not uh, widely adopting HD map yet. But if you look at the L4 robot taxi player, uh, they, are, they all pretty much all depend on very high precision HD map. Well, even for the L2 plus player, I think there's a trend more and more HD map technology has been used. This including Super Cruise, um, 
and many others, uh, new, uh, new players in this space as well. Fascinating. So my question to you, you mentioned the, the, the benefits now. So this is, this is, I totally agree with you, along with four or five sensors, you need another, another type of, call it a sensor, call it an information source, in order to localize with relative to your environment and, and, and make decisions. Now, we know the limitation of GPS, right? How does deep map work? How do you localize? Do you depend on GPS? Do you have camera? How does the technology work? We build a digital cologne or reconstruction of the environment with very rich sensor data. This including camera, GPS, IMU, LIDAR, um, all this sensor information. We build a digital cologne in 3D, full 3D, right? And, and also we will try to keep this digital cologne as fresh as possible while the self-driving cars using the map. And then how do we use this map is we use this map to localize and also the new role sensor data to localize where the car is inside this digital clone. The difference between our approach and uh, some of the other players, number one, we use a very uh, high precision digital clone of the environment and it's all also 3D. And when we do the localization, because we, our map is very high resolution and uh, it's full blown 3D, this gives us a lot of redundancy data so that we can do a better job of localizing the vehicle in a more reliable way. I think that's one of the uh, approach. And because our uh, technology, we can do this uh, very quickly. That's Got it. 100 hertz, right? So uh, this is actually not easy to achieve. <laughs> uh, even when you have more data, and you have to finish all the calculation quickly. So it's, it's difficult, but it is critical for the safety of the uh, self-driving car. And when you don't have enough data, then the localization result may not be very reliable. And this will have some consequences to planning and control the vehicle as well. Fascinating. So what you said is you use all kinds of sensors. You use camera, IMU, radio lighter, all kinds of sensor and GPS. Do you like preload the data of the environment from your cloud, or is it? Re or do you then then differentiate with the with the real time data of the actual sensors? How does that work? Is it like you have uh, filmed every everything in your city? Should I expect anything like that? <laughs> That's a very good question, right? So um, it depends on the scenarios, right? So if you're looking uh, at a level four vehicle or a robot taxi, or a car, a car doesn't need a driver, delivery vehicle, or things like that. This kind of vehicle, they usually have enough sensor. Basically, it's a robot. It's a robot that can understand the environment and navigate the environment. For this kind of uh, applications, the HD map is almost like a byproduct of the vehicle. So think of this way, if you want to deploy a vehicle to a certain campus or a certain city, the vehicle itself will be tested in that city and region. And through the testing phase, we'll collect a lot of data and we use that data to make the map. And while the robot is roaming inside the region, the robot is using the map and also at the same time update the map. That's for the L4 or robot taxi or robotic application case. There's also the other case, which is uh, L2, L2 plus L3 consumer vehicle. There's a driver there. And uh, for this kind of cars, it has some limitation on the sensors it has, at least at this stage of the industry. It has some limitation on the computation power on the vehicle. So in this case, what we can do is the vehicle itself may not have the high precision map making or update capability. It has some limit capability of creating high precision map data. At the same time, it can consume the HD map, no problem. It's almost like a, 
read-only version of the HD map. But at the same time, of course, they're, they're collecting a lot of information, crowdsource the data, and that data can be useful for updated map as well. In that situation, what we do is we, we create the map first and then share that data among the L2 plus L3 vehicles and they use a map, just a consumer of the map. At the same time, we harvest some of the data and see how we can use the data update map. That kind of a two approach. So you have uh, for L4, it's, they are your data source, you're crowdsourcing it for, uh, for L1, L2, it's the mix. You give them some a priori data at the same time you collect data. Uh, it's sort of crowdsourcing. I love that. So, I mean, we if we think about connected drive where we're getting traffic and real-time traffic information, we're, we're, it, it would be sort of like that, right? Can you tell me a little bit about your business model? So, um, automotive industry, um, I assume that your application is not only automotive industry. Is that true? That's true. Okay. That's actually a very, very good point. HDMAP yes. is necessary for a lot of other applications. Yeah, a lot of other. So since this is Autonomous Vehicle Safety and Security Podcast, we'll just narrow it down to automotive application and ask you, so automotive industry is a little different. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a different way it, it operates traditionally. Of course, things are changing. You know, We have a lot of Silicon Valley startups. Things are changing. Our business model is like you you ship a product, uh, SOP, code is frozen, and you ship the product, the product stays 20 years in the market. We are doing a little bit of over there update these days, but this this is even this is new. Things are gonna change when it comes to AV. Forget about security threats, forget about safety threats. Just for the feature, just for the, for the object recognition. I mean, in Munich, we have new kinds of object like uh, e-scooter that we didn't have five years ago. The environment is changing. For that reason, we'll have to radicalize the way things work. Now, the supply chain is already complex. For one vehicle, we have, if we count tier one, tier two, tier three, we have 3,000 suppliers in the supply chain for one product. And new players will come and I assume DeepMap or DeepMap-like companies who will want to sell services. We have this product, this is our service. What is your business model, especially for automotive industry? Our business model is actually a revolutionary one in the mapping business. So it depends on what type of customers we're talking about. And also the customers are changing, as you mentioned. So when we design the company's business model, when we start a company, we actually look at the core problem that we are facing in the industry. So what, what is the core problem of the industry, right? The core problem of the industry is the traditional map approach has a major problem. The traditional map approach is you have a separation between the map maker and the map consumer. Right, the map maker do a lot of the data collection, create a map, and then delivers this map to the consumer, and the consumer can use it on the web browser or a mobile phone. Uh, it's like one direction. Well, in the self-driving car space, I think eventually it will be a closed loop. The car is creating the map, and the car is consuming the map. And what actually is missing is this capability and service that keep creating and updating the map in the loop. This is what we believe uh, is a core problem down the road. And that's why we started a company. To solve that problem, uh, if you look, look at this uh, HD map, it's very expensive, right? A lot of company cannot afford this kind of a high precision map. Uh, if you use a traditional way of creating this map, you actually create a map once and share among a lot of customers so that you can uh, share the cost of making the map. Well, in this new domain where the, uh, the car is both the consumer and the producer of this map, what we can share is share the map, map making capability so that we can share the infrastructure, the tooling, the operation, all the, uh, all the machine learning uh, that we did in-house among our customer. However, every customer created their own maps or update their own maps using their own fleet. So with that vision, our ultimate business model is a service model, SaaS model. 
we basically, this is actually what we have been trying to do in the L4 space uh, with the early players in that space. We provide a service and update the map and create a map according to the customer's very specific need. However, we're now talking about L2 plus market, which is an immediate market. And also there's a lot of challenges for this market because there's a lot of limitations. So first you have limited computing resources, right? You have limited sensors in this kind of vehicles. And the most importantly, you have a, you have a very limited budget. Each car, you know, you're selling the vehicle to a consumer. It has to be fairly affordable. So the other thing is, I'll say is very critical as well, is the over the air update. So think about this, you have like every two, three years, you have a new model of cars and the car will have different sensors and different computing framework. At the same time, even for the same model of the cars, you have over the air update, your uh, software module probably will be changed as well. So all these things need to share a digital infrastructure, which is HD, HD map. So it's almost like everything is changing. Well, they, they kind of share, expect to share a same digital infrastructure. This has a requirement that the map has to be future proof and has to be, have the capability of super flex, flexibility. Because when you have a new model coming in, you, you, have, a, uh, you have your software updated, you, you might expect different type of features inside the map. So, uh, so that's a major challenge. That's why we try to solve the core problem. How do we build a SaaS model to solve the L4 problem, which is a little bit of future in the future, right? Different L4 applications and uh, using different type of map and doing a service. Well, we develop that capability, then we use that capability to help L2 plus market so that we can have the flexibility, benefit the customer and make sure the map is future proof. While your car become L2+, plus, L2++, plus, plus, L2++, plus, 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 <laughs> or L3, they can still keep using our map and service. At the same time, we can also share the map among yeah. customers. So it's kind of a mixture of traditional map business model and the new capabilities, the flexibility, the, uh, the future proof into this model. Fascinating. So if you're talking about such um, a shared envi environment where uh, OEMs, fleet providers, autonomous vehicle software providers, autonomous car driving software providers, like companies like Waymo, Uber, uh, all of them will be using and contributing to the map. They'll be using and contributing to the map. The consumers will be using and contributing to the map. Um, is there a need for standardization for the digital structure? You're talking about a digital clone. So we need a digital structure, which is standardized. And is there any, any initiative in that, uh, in that domain? There's definitely a need, definitely a need to standardize it. Second, there has been a lot of efforts try to standardize HD map for many, many years, actually. There's a lot of big companies trying very hard to do this. We believe eventually there could be a standard for HD map, but how long that will be, it's very, very difficult to predict. And we believe a standardization will benefit every player as well. However, how that will become a reality, the path or the route is to that destination is not clear so far. Might be the case like one so, so when we talk about standardization of HD map, it's actually not the standardization of HD map for self-driving cars. It's actually the standardization of the self-driving car stack. Because in the self-driving car stack, uh, technology stack, HD map is part of the self-driving car brain. It's very difficult to standardize this module without standardized planning and control, the localization, 
of the other module, the simulation, the other module of this brain. So I think eventually a lot of these modules will kind of stabilize and that their interface become uh, relatively stable and then there might be a standardization of HDMAP. But for the time being, it seems still pretty difficult, especially the technologists still in their early stage and there's a rapid uh, evolution in each of the modules I just mentioned, right? And there's also this, what makes things even more complicated is, you know, you have different uh, regulations, <laughs> traffic regulations in different countries. You have maps of different places. You have maps of different applications, right? There's like a highway map for trucking, urban map for, uh, for robot taxi, and then you have like sidewalk map for delivery, logistic, last mile delivery stuff, right? So we have, we have seen all this, by the way. We have been mapping in eight different countries and a lot of different sectors of the self-driving car space. So it will be a challenge to standardize the interface and the HT map. And there's also a lot of companies trying to do this still, uh, including uh, some, some of the map makers in Japan, in China, and some of the major players in Europe and America as well. Um, they made some progress, but I think there's also a lot of issues associated with that approach. What we try to help is try to have the super capability of doing pretty much all kind of customization that customer need. So we come from the self-driving car space, right? We focus on like what a self-driving car need and what kind of the functionality it will need from the map. Then we develop the core infrastructure and tool chain to do that. Well, when we deliver this to our customer, we do a very deep customization and integration with the customer's need. So this not only satisfy the customer's need, but also through the years give us this kind of a super capability because we serve all kind of customer, we kind of understand what they need uh, and we can predict pretty safely what kind of features they would like to have. And we have developed that capability in our map spec to cover that need down the road. And all the, the whole purpose of this is to save money for our customer so that different customers can share the infrastructure, the tooling, the engineering that we put our heart and soul <laughs> into this product. So um, I'll move to Another point. So, I mean, this is a perfect segue for that, I believe, because you talked about sharing data. So, as you know, in Europe, we have this regulation since last year, actually 2018, not last year, it's been a while, <laughs> uh, GDPR um, and people sharing data. A lot of people, uh, time to time, they don't want to share data. They, they have privacy con concerns and stuff. At the same time, I see the benefit. Like when, when we talk about sharing traffic information, I see the benefit. You know, the benefit is overweighs my, my privacy need. So I do share my data. Do you see any privacy challenge or some challenge in terms of regulations with respect to GDPR? Yeah, sharing data is, is a major problem, in my opinion, down the road. The privacy, so, so if you think of a self-driving car or a car vehicle with self-driving capability and sensor capability, it is kind of similar to your mobile phone. It observes everything, right? It tracks every move you make, right? It's not only that it tracks all the changes in the environment. So there definitely will be a major uh, privacy concern of this, just like what happened in the mobile phone industry. Uh, I, I don't want anybody to track me <laughs> or know uh, what's going on, like record my conversation and store in some places that have no control, right? So this is kind of a scary scenario. 
I think this will happen to the self-driving car space as well. Uh, the other thing is if you talk about specifically about the mapping, because mapping is kind of a digital clone of the environment. I like the word digital clone of the environment, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. So, yeah, it's a, uh, we are making a digital clone. And the environment could be a private property or a, a company-owned uh, campus or a very secretive place, right? You don't want people to understand. So in these kind of scenarios, it's very difficult to define the ownership of the digital clone, right? It's almost like there's a copyright of that digital clone somehow, <laughs> and you want to, the owner of the real property would like to have some kind of control of this digital property. So sometimes this kind of, of course, on the public street is probably the data should be public available or belong to some government agencies, something like that. Or uh, that's, that's one way. But for the private sector, it's hard to say who should really own the data. The car guys, the software guys, the cloud guys, <laughs> or the consumer <laughs> itself who own actually the car, right? So it's, it's very difficult. I think privacy data ownership will become a, a big topic down the road. And uh, our business model is kind of a kind of try to solve that problem without force a certain ownership model or privacy model so that we just provide the capability and the service and we enable our customer to decide if we want, they want to share the data or they don't want to share the data. But this kind of capability actually need extra work, <laughs> right? To need better technology to make this even possible yeah. down the road. Uh, this is a kind of our approach. And different countries, different regions of the world have different regulations on how to protect the geospatial data. And we are fully aware of that. So it, this will be a challenge. That's also, this challenge will need is calling for revolutionary uh, approaches in the map and self-driving car space, actually. I totally, totally agree with you. This will be a challenge. At the same time, what I think, you know, technology will win over privacy need because it's all about convenience. When I, as a consumer, will see the amount of benefit, the amount of convenience technology is bringing me, I would share my data. I, and this is how this is how things happen in, in technology space. We have seen people, um, they are more willing to, they, they love sharing data versus they love privacy. You know, they, they voluntarily share data. This is the, this is the uh, business model of the big internet industry called social media, right? I mean, that's why they, they're, they're, they're surviving. I do not see um, that it's, it's like, it's gonna be very different from, uh, from, from what happened in the past. However, you know, regulations are there and what the thing that you mentioned that they're willing to, they're, 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 you're taking their consent and uh, things get, get uh, you know, obviously different. Now the corner case, I mean, I would, are they corner cases, special cases that you mentioned, private property, co uh, company owned campus, uh, definitely this is going to be different because when, when you, uh, even today when we walk into a, a big corporation, sometimes you have to put something on your, on your, on your mobile phone camera, right? I mean, this is, this is already happening today. I think with also with the AV industry, there will be some regulations like that. Uh, with that, I want to move a little bit in safety. What kind of safety benefit do you think a, such HD maps would bring to automotive industry? It's like a redundancy uh, system of the self-driving car. It's a critical module for planning and control as well so that you know all the details like how far are you are away from uh, that lane and and how far you're away from the stop line what's kind of the digital uh how do i say digital real way in a region where you don't see the lane markings for example in a giant intersection right um and uh, what's the optimal control when you are a bridge or a tunnel or a, a complex scenario. 
um, well, making a giant turn. What's the best way to control the vehicle? What's a slope, right? Uh, and how do you control the vehicle? I think this kind of information is critical from, from HD map. And also, you know, obstacle, right? If you have obstacles um, around you, how you can see through them and make the plan more robust. Um, there's, uh, and also simulation. Top of my head, the simulation, you need to do like a, tens of thousands more simulation before you actually jump to the real world testing. And uh, simulation is, 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 uh, should be heavily rely on very high fidelity HD map that is mirroring the real, uh, reality as well, right? So this is also a critical piece that we can help. Um, uh, so, and also a prior knowledge of the environment um, and change detection, right? So these two things comes together. When the environment changes, you would like to understand and the self-driving car should behave differently when there's like the environment changes. So there's a few top uh, important features that HD map can help. But the number one requirement I think for the L2 and uh, self-driving car space in general is we need to make this thing affordable. Uh, I think the HD map space is actually underinvested severely underinvested in my opinion. If you look at the self-driving car space in general, there's like maybe like 50, $70 billion invested into this space. And there's a lot of uh, full stack companies have like billions of dollars, or they're burning billions a year, right? Uh, however, if you look at the mapping space, there's not many big players um, or serious investment in this space, number one. Number two, if you look at the sensor space, you can see there's like maybe 70, 80 LiDAR companies and a lot of radar companies and other new type of camera companies. Well, if you look at the chip industry, the AI part of the, uh, the computing part of this uh, self-driving car technology, you have Intel, NVIDIA, all these major players. And there's a lot of uh, companies like developing their own chips like Tesla spending a lot of money doing this. Well, for the map industry, I think it's severely under investment. And, and this, I think, is a major threat to the whole self-driving car industry in general. Because with, what we're talking about, we're talking about the digital infrastructure of the self-driving car. If we don't build the, the real way, how can you have the train running all over this place? This is kind of the I example love that I analogy. Used. <laughs> right? It's not like we see the money pouring all over other places, but we don't see significant investment into True. the mapping space. Absolutely. Which is, yeah, which is kind of a, astonishing to me. I think this, this place should be uh, has more attention. Um, by the way, I think there's countries investing in digital infrastructure now and they're spending a lot into this space and not digital infrastructure, physical infrastructure as well. I think this self-driving car technology is the combination of physical infrastructure improvement, digital infrastructure, and also the uh, self-driving capability and the sensor technology, computing technology involved in the, in the vehicle itself, right? This is kind of a three type of technology work together and also with some regulation changes, new type of insurance company to help this become a real commodity that is safe and affordable. Fascinating. I, I totally, totally agree with you that uh, we've seen investments in autonomous vehicle sphere massively in different angles. However, we haven't seen uh, investments in HD mapping. What do you think is the reason? because it's very difficult and the talent is kind of limited, right? There's also a lot of noise in the industry. There's also people want to go the, find a shortcut, like mm -hmm. let's bypass the HD map right? because it's so difficult and so hard to make. 
there's no standard. How do we solve this problem, right? <laughs> right? So um, maybe we can get, get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, like a similar argument like LiDAR and new type of sensors, right? New type of computing architecture, new type of AI. Maybe we can get away with self-driving car technology without using LiDAR. Or, you know, imaging radar or whatever is kind of new technologies. Uh, that, but I think the reality is we just can't compromise safety. Absolutely. So what I've seen is, you know, um, we, we need to we need to build the digital infrastructure. What I've seen is the trend is big data is coming. We have different kinds of data. We have sensor data. We have road uh, um, condition data. Let's collect the data. So I've seen people building, investing on infrastructure to collect those data. But oftentimes I've seen the purpose of collecting the data was missing. You know, you're collecting the data because big data has been a trend in the last couple of years. Uh, we're talking about big data all the time. Now, um, when it comes to HD map, do you think the, the sensor data, the road condition data, these things will also contribute to, to building the environment, between building a digital clone in the clone of the environment, as you mentioned? Yes, of course. I think the, the sensor data will definitely help uh, make some contributions to at least give people a hint where things has been changed, yeah. right? Um, however, not all data are created equal. <laughs> right? Most of the data actually has very low quality. And when you have a low quality, you can think of them as valuable data and also think of them as noise mm -hmm. that try to mess up your system. Mm -hmm. So I have been a mapping engineer all my life. Uh, one of the major challenges we have been uh, fighting with is how do you deal with wrong data? Mm. All day data, but when you, especially when you have a, you try to build a ground truth map, but you have different source of data with different timestamp and fidelity. How do you figure out the ground truth based on this kind of a, especially when we're talking about centimeter level precisions, right? That is also critical and critical changes in the environment. So I think a lot of data will be helpful but there's also a dramatic need of ground truth information. Ground truth is really the... So, um, how granular are HD map? What can I ex expect? I mean, you mentioned lane. Is it precise to inches? Or uh, how granular is the HD, HD map data? And also, are we having also 3D inf information along with HD map? All the HD maps supposed to be 3D, even if it's like a vector layer or a landmark layer, right? All this information is 3D because that's the only way you can register this information precisely and uh, figure out what are the changes happens to them. And even if you see, a lot of people assume the road surface flat. Actually, it's not flat. <laughs> There's a curve on the road surface, actually. <laughs> Even on a street, uh, uh, straight street, right? There's a curve on the road surface as well. Um, and also, there's a lot of uh, geometry information, like the curbs um, and the regions where you can... Uh, in a normal situation, you can't drive, but in an emergency situation, you can drive on it. And uh, there's um, uh, this kind of information is 3D. It's all in 3D. Everything's in 3D space um, and on a globe. Right? <laughs> so when we're talking about centimeter precisions, how to model the Earth is also important. And how do we track this kind of centimeter level of changes? It's, it's not that easy, actually. But given our background building Google Earth and uh, many other uh, map products, we actually handled similar problems before uh, in a very large scale. So we learned a lot through that. We're just trying to Using what we are able to do to help the industry solve this giant HD map creation and update problem um, to make this thing really affordable for the uh, self-driving cars. That's really our mission. That's why we're working so hard every day because, you know, this is not an easy problem.
that's a perfect segue to ask my next question, which I was what, which I was waiting to ask you. So you talked about your background. You're a computer scientist. I mean, I'm a computer scientist too, and I'm I'm an entrepreneur. You moved toward entrepreneurship. How did that happen? I mean, it's a big, big thing. I mean, entrepreneurship is a big commitment, right? I mean, what was your story? What led you toward entrepreneurship? I mean, being a CEO of a company, it's like when things escalates to you, it's usually not the best news, you know? So when something goes wrong, it escalates. So how, 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 did, you, how did you decide to be an entrepreneur and lead a company, a tech company? I actually don't like to be the uh, entrepreneur uh, or the CEO type of thing. I'm an I'm a engineer and researcher myself, and I, have, I like to solve challenging problems. And there has been a lot of challenging problems in the math industry uh, through the years. Well, once I get involved in self-driving and I realize there's this giant problem of HD map and looking at my background and we actually have a good idea of how to do it, <laughs> how to solve it. I think it's like the problem is calling me to do something, right? And when I, when I got the idea to start DeepMap and talk to my co-founder, Mark, to get him involved and fund the company together, uh, I think we got a calling. that This is kind of our mission. We have to fix this problem somehow. I think that's the starting point. You just, it's kind of a mission calling you, you just cannot run away. And if the company needed me to be a CEO, I'll be a CEO. <laughs> if we need to be the CFO, I'll be the CFO. Need to me to do anything, I'll just do it. Because it's this the is mission. a mission. This is a mission. Yes. We have to achieve our goal, build this giant HD map engine that is fully automated and that can create crunching uh, data from millions of cores and can create HD map to the centimeter level precision and update it according to different customers need and make it future proof. It's, 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 a, it's a giant mission actually. It uh, is and, a giant mission, yeah. And we're, we're not there yet. We didn't know how far we can go when we started a company. When was it started? When, 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 when was 2016, started? April, right? It's four and a half years ago almost. Um, and when we started a company, we didn't know how far we can go, but we know for sure this is the right direction for us. This is the right solution to the industry. And we need to do something to, to this problem. And that's how we started. And once we started, we realized actually uh, some of the customer telling us this is music to our ears. What do you guys do? It's exactly what we need. We're solving a lot of customers' pain spot. Uh, and making their self-driving car development faster and safer, most importantly, a lot cheaper <laughs> right? than doing this in-house or you know, try to buy some existing map and try to work on top of it. it that approach suffers a lot for them, right? Got it. So what was your biggest hurdle was it fundraising like wh where are you now it is like are you are you done with fundraising uh wh where are you now in the startup journey yeah i think investment we we actually raised a lot of money uh, uh in the in the first two years two and a half years and we haven't raised money since two years ago right because we try to build a solution and to get scale up our solution right now this is our biggest hurdle, I think, now is how do we further scale up our solution? If you think of this, we have been serving a lot of customers in the last four years, actually three years, right? The first year we were kind of developing. Um, and we served a lot of different customers. We learned a lot. Maps in different countries, different applications, L2+, plus, L3, L4 trucking, <laughs> all these different places, right? We served four or five trucking companies. We are serving uh, logistic company doing like delivery, last mile delivery. We're serving L2 plus customers. We're making continental size maps right now. I think the biggest hurdle for us right now is how do we scale up so that we can handle thousands of uh, vehicles, millions of vehicles that we can constantly updating the map. This is, this is a, like the core, core problem for 
DeepMap or for the map engine or for the self-driving car industry in general, because you can't make a business with two, three cars, even 20 cars. You need to have a huge fleet. And for the consumer vehicles, it's a huge fleet already from day one. And they need a giant map from day one and fresh, high precision, customized to the, and who can build this map? And how can we reduce the, the price of this, a unit price of this map to pennies, right? So this is kind of what the L2 plus and the OEM industry need. This is a giant, giant obstacle. So we're fighting a very big battle right now. Um, I think that's from the engineer perspective, that's the biggest challenge for us. From the uh, market side, I think one hurdle is still the same, uh, as I mentioned, there's still this kind of a uh, noise and there's this kind of uh, uncertainty about how much investment OEMs or uh, serious self-driving car players need to put into building this kind of digital infrastructure to make self-driving car a reality. In my opinion, this is severely underinvested, right? And people have unrealistic expectations for their self-driving car capabilities and the cost. They don't understand when you're making and building a centimeter level map and maintain it. This is actually a non-trivial engineering. It is non-trivial, absolutely. This split brings me to, it makes me curious. You can't start with two, three vehicles. You can't start with 20, you need millions to get started. How did you get started? Did you have a million vehicle that you had access to? We don't have a million vehicles right now. And when we, uh, through the years, while we're serving our customer, we develop a technology that we can make uh, very portable and a simple device that we can bootstrap the effort uh, with a fraction of the cost of a survey vehicle before. Yet we can use this kind of a portable device to create the level four, level five level of future proving map that we need to create. So that's kind of a technology we developed. It's not just the hardware, the software, the algorithm behind it is also playing a major role. And we use this kind of a, a portable device we ship it all over the place and then make a map. Uh, and and uh, we use this update the map as well. And we use this map to help the industry. So this is how you, uh, you know, kind of, kind of bypass the hurdle of having million. So you have, with your device, you created a infrastructure. Now those millions of vehicle when jo they join the ecosystem, they will contribute in updating what you've already built. Right, we're kind of doing like a really a fairly cheap bootstrap. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, once the vehicles, bootstrap. you have the fleet, you have the giant fleet, we can retire our uh, survey devices. Uh, it depends, right? If, you, if, the, if your fleet, the L2 fleet can create the high precision map as good as our survey devices, now we can retire it. Otherwise, we can still use them to periodically patch and update the map when there's dramatic geometry-related changes or semantic-related changes in the, in the, in the map. Um, well, once you have this fleet that has high-end sensors on it, that high-quality data that can update the map, we actually don't need our bootstrap device ever. <laughs> okay, yeah. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So, uh, James, I have one last question. So we're at an era that we, we're going to see massive, massive changes in the automotive industry. You know, uh, AV, electrification of vehicle, then connected vehicle, and all these technologies. It's going to change the way we commute from point A to point B. What do you think is the most positive aspect for us human uh, due to this change? Actually, there's two. two. One of the save lives. I think car accident will obsolete. <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> right? so we do want to make car accidents obsolete. Yeah. So this is like, I have been working in the infrastructure a long time, right? Uh, computer infrastructure. Whenever you have a human in this loop, 
the system is not stable <laughs> or not. Uh, you cannot really automate the system. Once you have human move out of the system, which is transportation, and um, uh, the whole thing can be automated. The efficiency can uh, really increase. And most importantly, you don't have accident as many, right? There will be still accident, but it will be dramatically reduced. Can you think of like, has humans managing like the, computers in a data center with millions of computers, right? It's, it's very, very difficult. However, today, every single week, we have a driver, <laughs> right? So, however, the week will become computers. We have millions of computers roaming around the globe and no humans driving, driving them. It's all under a system, a well, very well-designed system to manage them. This will be a very safe system and super efficient. You probably don't even need traffic lights, <laughs> right? In the future, right? Because the car will understand yeah. what they want to do. Yeah. I think the safety is the biggest. The other part is saving time. It's just making everybody's life like 20% longer. <laughs> I think they just have Absolutely. more time to do other things. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree with it saving lives and making lives 20% longer. With that note, thank you so much, James. It was lovely having you. So if you have liked this episode, feel free to hit the like button and write what you think about it in the comment section. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. We'll love to uh, get back to you with your question. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. James, thank you so much. It was lovely having you here. Thank you. Thank you so much.